All right, it's time for some practice using limits and the definition of limits in particular. Now, as always, you should try to do these problems as much as you can on your own before seeing the solution. So make frequent use of the pause button because the more that you can do, the better that you'll get. And you're going to be fantastic. You're going to get really good at this. All right, well, this is going to be fun. Let's get into it. Use the definition of limit to show that the limit as x goes to 1 of x squared plus 4x plus 3 equals 8. Okay, so we're using the definition of limit. In some sense, polynomials are really nice, so we kind of expect that this, in fact, is the right answer, but we want to be really careful. So, let's talk about where we're going. So, what we want to show, this is our f of x, and here is our l. So, our goal for right now is we want to show that absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Remember, epsilon is going to be just some arbitrary, usually think small number. Okay, so let's see what that would translate into. That says we want to have absolute value of x squared plus 4x plus 3 minus 8 to be less than epsilon. Okay, so that's our goal. Good. Now, we're going to have to specify at some point what delta is, but we're going to wait for a second. So we're going to first sort of explore. So now let's focus on this expression here. And one thing to keep in mind, and this is the, the real key to doing all these types of problems, is remember we can make absolute value of x minus 1 uh, small as we like. In other words, we get a choice. So we might make it very small, but keep that in the back of your mind. So we want to seek out an absolute value of x minus 1. And why is it x minus 1? Because x goes to 1. So x minus a, x minus 1. So what do we have here? Well, this would be x squared plus 4x minus 5, because you take 3 minus 8. Now, x squared plus 4x minus 5 will factor. Now, we expect it to factor because... We expect if we plug in 1, we'll get 0. We can actually check 1 plus 4 minus 5 is 0. Okay, so it does factor 1 as a root, which means that this factors as x plus 1, and then it's not so hard to figure out, uh, whoops, not x plus 1. Ah, that would be if negative 1 is a root. Okay, ha, 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 x minus 1, because 1 is a root, and the other term is x plus 5. It's not so hard once you know one root. You can figure out the other one pretty quickly. All right. Now, one of the nice things about absolute value is if I take the absolute value of a product, I can take the absolute value of each piece, the absolute value of x minus 1 and the absolute value of x plus 5. Now, we're happy with this. Why are we happy with this? Because we know that this piece right here, I can choose this to be small. Now, I haven't specified what that means yet. And the reason I haven't done it yet is because I have to also look and say, wait a second, hold on, what about this piece? See, I have to make this small enough so I can compensate for whatever that is. Now, what do we know about x plus 5? Well, it turns out that x plus 5 can be arbitrarily large. And at this point, you might feel like, ah, we were so close, so, so close. But, remember, the idea of limits is to say, what's happening nearby? So, here's what we'll do. Is we're going to say, look, we're going to assume we're close by. So, let's first off, we can say, we'll choose delta to be less than or equal to 1. Okay? So, I'm just saying, I'm going to be close, certainly within 1. Alright, so that's the choice I've made. We'll come back and see what we do with that in a second. So let's suppose that delta is less than or equal to 1. So in other words, I'm guaranteed that absolute value of x minus 1 is less than 1. Now, that tells me that if I drop the absolute value sign, negative 1 is less than x minus 1 is less than positive 1, or 0 is less than x is less than 2. So in other words, I can say I'm going to be close enough I can assume my x is close enough to 1, in this case, between, say, 0 and 2. 
Now, what comes next? Well, from here, we can say, aha, so, for instance, absolute value of x is, say, less than 2. All right? Now, how does that help us? Well, look at this expression. See, x plus 5, right now, that seems arbitrary. But I can actually say something. Well, what can I say about x plus 5? Well, I could. I don't need to do this, but, ah, oh, I want to use the triangle inequality. It's a good time. Any time's a good time to use the triangle inequality. That's less than equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of 5, right? Because, you know, I take the absolute value of each piece, add it up, and that's at most 7. So, because we're making an assumption that we're close to 1, we can say, aha, this part is really below 7. It might be a lot less than 7, I don't know. Uh, probably not too much less than 7. Okay, so that's good news for us. So, remember, what's our goal? We know this part is at most 7, and our goal, we haven't finished this yet, this is our goal. We want this whole thing to be less than epsilon. So, that says, hey, what I can do is this will work if we do the following. So divide both sides by 7 if the absolute value of x minus 1 is less than 1 seventh of epsilon. See? Because now, what happens next? So, I remember, I had there was one condition, delta is at most 1. We're now going to add a second condition. Delta is at most, let's say, 1 seventh epsilon. Okay? Now you can choose a strict less than if you want, it doesn't really matter. So now we have two things. If delta is less than or equal to 1, we make sure that this part is small. If delta is less than or equal to 1 7th epsilon, we make sure that part is small. In fact, then this is smaller than 1 7th epsilon times 7, which is smaller than epsilon. And we're done. So, how do we do it? So now the answer is we make a little note here off to the side. So, given any epsilon greater than zero, we choose our delta, well, to be what? Well, we want both these things to be true. So we choose delta to be the smaller of these two, the min of the numbers one and one-seventh of epsilon. Then, and then the rest of this is dot, 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 really. But the absolute value of x minus 1 is less than delta. Then absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Ah! And that's, that's it. That's it. So really, what do we do here? You might want, depending upon who your math instructor is, they may have you repeat the argument. This is one of the things about epsilon delta proofs. This is what's called an epsilon delta proof, is you kind of do it twice. You do it one time to figure out what the right choice for delta is, and then the second time you say, now let me feed delta in, and we're good to go. But if you've just run through it once, you can see what's happening. We know what our goal was. We said, okay, we want that to be small. We said, aha, I see there's an x minus 1. I know I, that can be small, and so now I'm, I'm carefully pick my delta in such a way to guarantee that combined, the whole thing is smaller than epsilon. And therefore that delta is the right kind of delta to pick. So there we go. And that's, that's the proof. So now we know that limit. And you're probably thinking like, that's a lot of work for one function at one point. Well, we oftentimes generalize. In fact, it's not so hard to prove that for any polynomial limit exists. But you need a couple of basic facts, some of which will prove later on. All right. Good. Well, that's a type of problem that's so nice. Let's do it again. Use the definition of limit to show that the limit as x goes to 2 of 1 over x equals a half. So in other words, if you plug in 2 into 1 over x, you should get Something that looks like a half. You know, okay, like, okay, that seems reasonable. All right, so what do we do? Well, 
again, we start thinking about our process. So let's start by writing down our goal. What's our goal? Our goal is we want to have our function f of x minus l, which in our case, that's 1 over x minus 1 over 2 to be less than epsilon, where epsilon is some arbitrarily, usually small number. Okay, so now we're going to start digging into it. So, where, where do we start digging? Well, remember, we're looking at limit as x goes to 2. So here's sort of our, our tool. And our tool is we can make x minus 2 is small. So, if I can find a way to incorporate x minus 2 into this expression, I have a win because I know I can make that part small. So we're going to start by taking the current expression and doing some manipulations to it so that we can find an x minus 2 on the inside. So let's see what we can do. 1 over x minus 1 over 2. Well, it feels like an algebra thing because we have two fractions combined together. So we'll add the fractions up. In this case, take a difference of fractions. So this is the same as the common denominator would be 2x. So 2 over x minus, uh, sorry, 2 over 2x minus x over 2x. Or, if you like, that's 2 minus x over 2x. Which, you can take the absolute value of the top and the absolute value of the bottom. Now, two things we can do. In the bottom, you can easily plot it too, because you can pull out positive constants. In the top, 2 minus x. Like, ah, oh, so close. We wanted x minus 2. We got 2 minus x. But wait. If you think about what absolute value says, the absolute value of x minus 2 is how far apart x and 2 are. The absolute value of 2 minus x is how far apart 2 and x are. Well, they're the same distance. We're just saying, you know, what's the order? Well, okay, so it's the same. So, if things are the same, we're good to go. So, what can we say? Well, this is really absolute value of x minus 2 over 2 absolute value of x. Now, I'm going to rewrite this. So, this is absolute value of x minus 2 and a 1 half and... 1 over x. Uh, well, absolute value of x on the end. So, we say to ourselves, okay, we're in good shape. We know we can make this small, and we're going to hold off of what that means until we figure out how to con control the rest of it. Uh, I can decide whether I want to say contain or control. Well, both work in this case. We know how to handle the half because a half is a half. All right, no problem. The question is, how do you handle the 1 over absolute value of x? So, here's that case where we say, well, look, we're not looking over all x. I only need to look for x near 2. So, what I can say is, let's choose a condition that says we're going to be close to 2. In other words, let's say delta is an arbitrary. Let's say delta is at most. I like 1, but any number can work. It depends on context. You just want to make sure you have a number small enough that you're away from problems. So for example, if you pick 2, you'd be getting close to 0, right? Because 0 is 2 away from 2, and 1 over 0 is a big problem. You might even say it's infinitely big. So you just want to make sure you're avoiding the problem areas. But OK, so we'll choose delta to be at most 1, which tells us that the absolute value of x minus 2 is at most 1. All right, so far so good. And uh, we'll do what we did before. What does that really tell us? Well, it says we're within 1 of 2. So you can write this in a couple of ways. x minus 2 is below 1, greater than negative 1. Or add 2 to everything, 1 is less than x is less than 3. Now, it's positive. So if you throw in the absolute values, that doesn't change anything. OK, so now how do we know the absolute value of x is between 1 and 3? But I want 1 over absolute value of x. OK, so let's flip it. 1 over absolute value of x. 1 over 1 is 1. 1 over 3 is 1 third. What happens to my inequalities? When I have an inequality, see, this is, we've got to be careful with inequalities. You've got to 
they're a little bit more subtle. You got to keep track. You got to do a little bit more work, just a little bit. When you do an inequality and you flip both sides, you reverse the inequalities. So that's going to become like that. So what's the moral here? Well, assuming we're in this setting, and we'll make that assumption because that makes things easier to work with, then that tells us that 1 over absolute value of x is bounded by 1. OK. So updating. Because we're going to make this assumption, so we're going to say this is going to be less than absolute value of x minus 2 times a half. And now we're almost done. Why? Well, because remember, what was our goal? We want to say and that this is less than epsilon. So we say now we can pick what this should do. Because in essence, we said, look, I want to make sure this is small. I make sure everything else is not so big. And now I say, aha, I can pick. So that says we need to have the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 2 epsilon. So that is another constraint. Delta should be at most 2 epsilon. Now we're almost done. Because if we choose delta in such a way that it's below 1 and it's below 2 epsilon, then this shows us that 1 over x minus 1 over 2 is less than epsilon. And therefore, we just have to make a note. So given any epsilon greater than 0, choose delta to be the smaller of these two values, 1 and 2 epsilon. And then you do dot, dot, dot. And the dot, dot, dot is exactly what you have here. So again, it's, it's one of those things where you don't know quite what the right choice for delta is until the end. Then once you know what the right choice for delta is, you kind of have to rerun the argument if you're going to do this properly. Sometimes it's, if you were putting this together, you might say, let me leave a gap at the very start, run the argument, and then I'll put in what the answer should be at the top. That's, that's a smart idea. I should have done that. Maybe I'll do that next time. If there is a next time. <laughs> well, not, there's not one quite like this. All right, let's tackle a simple question. Hopefully it's simple. Is the following statement true or false? All right, 50-50 chance. Suppose that the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals l, and the limit as x goes to a of f of x is m. Then it has to be the case that l equals m. Now, one of the things that this is saying is it's saying, if I approach a value, it's unique. I can't approach two different values. So I can't simultaneously get close to a value l and a value m. They're too far apart. I can't do that at the same time. So that would be a nice fact about limits. seems like something we should know. And it doesn't seem like it should be too hard to prove. So let's think about how we could prove it. Now, there's lots of ways to, to think about approaching this. And here's um, one of my favorite ways to, to sort of do math problems. There's something called proof by contradiction. And it's kind of a fun idea. And uh, not everything has to be proved in this way. But it's kind of like, you know, if you were arguing with a, a very young relative, and you said, this is how it's done. And you're like, uh-uh. You know what I'm saying? They're sort of like, no. That's how I like to think of proof by contradiction. It's not quite that, but you know. I like to channel my inner, uh-uh. OK, so what's proof by contradiction? Well, I'm going to think that there's two boxes. And in one box, I, I have labeled it L equals M. And in the other box, I have L is not M. OK, so what do I need to do? Well, what I need to do is I have to figure out which box it goes into. Now, it has to pick a box because it must be one of these two things. Either L and M are the same or they're not the same. So I have to say, well, look, which box do I fall into? 
my goal is to show I'm falling into here. So I can say, if I can eliminate this as a possibility, then there's not two boxes, but one. Now I don't have a choice. I have to go into that box. So my goal is to show if L was not M, something crazy would happen. So let's see what crazy thing we can come up with. Suppose that L were not M. Now, we have to think, what does it mean to have the, the two numbers not be the same? Well, it means that they're not the same number. So, if they're not the same number, there's a gap. Remember, this is not calculus done by infinitesimals. Between any two numbers, there's a gap. That's an important idea. So, let's pick epsilon to just be the gap between L and M. In other words, how far apart are they? Okay, that's fine. We can always pick, pick an epsilon to be anything we want. Because they're not the same, this is a positive number, and we're fine. Okay, now we can say then there is some delta so that if I look at f of x minus l, it's below epsilon over 2. Why? Because epsilon over 2 is some positive number, and f of x minus l, I can always get, make that arbitrarily small. In particular, I can make it less than epsilon over 2 for 0 less than x minus a, less than delta. And by the same argument, the absolute value of f of x minus m, I can make that less than epsilon over 2 for the same, again, 0 less than x minus a, less than delta. Okay, so far, so good. Ah, excellent. Now, here we go. This is going to seem strange, but bear with me. At the end, we're going to like go, oh, okay, I see what you did there. So, what do we have? Well, we know epsilon is how far apart L and M are. So, L minus M. Now, I say, you know, I have things which involve L and things which involve M, but they both have F of X's attached. So we have ways to do that. I can rewrite this as, and this will look strange at first, but bear with me, F of X minus M minus F of X minus L. Okay, let's first verify that this is true. Notice what happens to the f of x's. They cancel. Minus m, which is good. Minus minus l is plus l. Good. Looking promising. Where do we go from here? Well, triangle inequality. So this is less than or equal to f of x minus m plus f of x minus l. All right. Now, Here's the catch. We know that we can make f of x minus l small and f of x minus m small at the same time. Just pick x sufficiently close. So this is less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2. And we'll make a note here for sufficiently small. Or maybe I should say, not small, let's say for sufficiently near x. Now, if you add epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, what do you get? Epsilon. Oh, whoa, something's weird here. Something's impossible. Because this says that epsilon is smaller than epsilon. You can't have a number smaller than itself. Numbers don't work that way. Which means that's an impossible situation for us to be in. All right. And so we've now said, hey, you cannot be here where L is not M. You must be going into that box. And so this is a true statement. Let me give you another way to think about what's happening here. And uh, if you don't like this, then that's okay. Um, like I said, there's other ways to think about what's happening. 
What's happening, thinking about it in a slightly different perspective, you have L and you have M. What do we know? Well, we know that we're getting close to L. Okay, so I'm thinking here, this is not my x-axis, this is my output. So I know I'm getting close to L. But I also know I'm getting close to M. To be close to L means I can pick some small interval and always be inside that small interval, as long as I'm close to A. And I can do the same thing here for M. Now the problem is, here's the challenge. I cannot be here for L and simultaneously be here for M because they don't overlap. See, that's what's really going on here, is we're using the fact that we picked, now what we ended up doing is we actually picked them just so that they just barely didn't overlap, so that there was no common points. And so we were able to say, hey, something's wrong here. Something's wrong here. But if you think about the picture this way, you're like, well, if I'm close to L, I can't simultaneously be close to M because I have to stay near L. And if I'm near L, I, I have to be in this little interval, which is far away from M. All right. Okay. Wow. Good stuff. Good stuff. Now we get into the really abstract stuff. So if the last problem wasn't abstract enough, we're about to go all in. Well, what I mean by that is we want to establish some generic properties. Because if you handle it case by case, it turns out that there's infinitely many cases. There's infinitely many functions, infinitely many points, and it gets really tedious. So we want to generate some principles. Now these are principles we've talked about in a different uh, topic. In other words, there are things that shouldn't surprise us. And now we're going to show how the definition of a limit helps us to establish that these are true. All right, so the first one we want to talk about. Use the definition of limits to show that if limit as x goes to a of f of x is L, and limit as x goes to a of g of x is M, then limit as x goes to a of f of x plus g of x is L plus M. All right, how do we do this? So... We think about what's true. We say to ourselves, well, because x goes to a of f of x equals l, that says that f of x minus l can be made small. In other words, we can guarantee that this quantity is a small quantity. Limit as x goes to a of g of x equals m means the same thing, that g of x minus m can be made small. And when we talk about can be made small, what we really are saying here is that there's some way for us to pick our deltas to guarantee that these are close to each other. So that's what I mean when we say that we can make these small. It's nice to keep in mind what's small and what's not when we, we step into this. Okay, so with that in mind, let's look at our goal. So our goal is we want to have f of x plus g of x, which is the function we're considering, minus L plus M. We want to make this smaller than epsilon. Okay, so let's think about what's true. Now, this is the same as F of x minus L plus g of x minus M. Now, do you see what we did here? It's called moving stuff around. That's what we did. So we just, you know, and also don't forget, of course, that minus sign comes through. So f of x minus l, g of x minus m. Why did we do that? Because we know something about f of x minus l. We know something about g of x minus m. Now, can you see what's going to come next? All right. Yes, that's right. We're going to do... Triangle inequality, which lets us do, basically we're going to put, but I'll do it in a separate line. So, absolute value of f of x minus l, and absolute value of g of x minus m. Okay, so that's triangle inequality. Now, how do we finish up? Well, we know we can make this small, as small as we want. We know we can make this small, as small as we want. And we want both of these things together to be smaller than epsilon. So we say to ourselves, aha, 
what we'll do is we'll break epsilon and say, look, we'll give a little bit of, of it over to here and a little bit over to here. So let's say we're going to have half epsilon. So we want this first part to be at most half epsilon, the second part to be most half epsilon. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pick, we'll call it our delta 1. So if x minus a, and I should include 0 less than x minus a less than delta 1, then f of x minus l is less than epsilon over 2. And I know that such a delta 1 exists because the limit exists. Same idea. Pick a delta 2. So if 0 is less than x minus a is less than delta 2, then g of x minus m is less than epsilon over 2. Again, why do I know such a delta 2 exists? Because I know the limit exists. So I'm using the facts that I have. So we're making good progress here. OK, so I know I can make this small, and I know I can make that small. And the question is, can I make them small simultaneously? So what we need is we need to make sure we're smaller than delta 1, and somehow at the same time, smaller than delta 2. So the way we do that is we're going to pick our delta to be the smallest of these two options, delta 1 and delta 2. All right? Good. So now we know how to pick our delta. Delta is the smaller. Now, once that's true, because delta is the smaller of the one, we know we satisfy the first statement and the second statement. So this is less than epsilon over 2, and that's less than epsilon over 2, which is epsilon. And now we've shown that by picking our delta, that our expression f of x plus g of x minus l plus m is less than epsilon. And we're done. Yes, we are done. We made it. Woohoo! Good. So that was a good warm up. Now, our finale, our last one. Good. And on a fun note. So, use the definition of limits to show that if the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals l, and the limit as x goes to a of g of x equals m, then the limit as x goes to a of f of x times g of x is equal to l plus m. Oh, okay. All right. This is going to be interesting. Now we have to start thinking about what do we want. Okay. So, keep in mind, we still have the same philosophies. f of x minus l and g of x minus m. Because we know the limits exist, we know that these can be made small. That's our starting point. We know that these are have the ability to make them as small as we need. And we might need to make them very small. We'll see as we go along. So now, what do we look at? Well, we're going to look at the following. f of x times g of x minus l times m. And our goal is to end up by arguing that by choosing our delta sufficiently small, we can make this expression sufficiently small. And of course, when we say sufficiently small, there's two sufficiently smalls going on. So by choosing our inputs close to a, we can get our outputs close to l times m. How do we do it? Now, the thing that makes this challenging when you first see it is we have two things varying. See, there's f of x and g of x, and there's l and m. And so that's sort of like we're switching two things up. And that does not seem to work really well with what we want to do. So we need to think about, OK, is there a better option? Because one of the things we can handle is we could handle one change at a time. If you look at other problems we had, well, it's like f of x minus l. If it was just f of x minus l, great, we can do it. Um, for just g of x minus m, great, we can do it. But now that we have both things changing simultaneously, that makes it more difficult. So this is sort of the great idea, which says, what if we only sort of had a 
an intermediate step where we change just one thing at a time. Ah, that would be helpful. So, what are we going to do? So we're not going to do anything fancy yet. It's going to be called add and subtract something. So, what do we do? We have f of x, g of x, and then what we'll do is we'll say subtract l times g of x, and we'll add l times g of x, then subtract l times m. Now, are we allowed to do this? Are we? And why are we allowed to do it? Well, the answer is we are allowed to do this because this turns out to be zero. And if you add and subtract zero, you haven't changed the value. So you might say, well, why bother adding and subtract zero if it doesn't change the value? Well, because it's not just any zero. It's a well-chosen zero. It has been chosen, carefully plucked, to give us insight. Well, how do we use this then? So, now what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's uh, take a look, and we're going to do our, our triangle inequality. Less than or equal to, I'm going to think of the first half and the second half. So I'm, I'm grouping in this way. You'll notice what's really cool here is now in this group, see how like there's a g of x in common, so I'm really only switching one piece. And here, there's an l in common, so again, I'm only switching one piece. So it's, I went from switching two at a time to switching one at a time, but doing it twice. And that makes life a little bit easier. So triangle inequality, we have f of x, g of x, minus l, g of x, plus l, g of x, minus l, m. And then there's sort of absolute values thrown in. I can factor out our pieces. So this is equal to f of x minus l times g of x plus g of x minus m times l. All right. Now, some good news for us. The good news for us is this second part is pretty straightforward to handle because l, it's a number. So we say to ourselves, hey, this is good, and we're going to, again, our goal here is we really want to aim for these two pieces each to be small, so small that when we add them up, they combine together to give us at most epsilon. So, sort of a new intermediate goal. We want to make this smaller than epsilon over 2. And we say to ourselves, well, here's something we can do, is we can say, well, look, if we want that to be true, we're going to pick say delta 1, so that we can say that the absolute value of g of x minus m is less than epsilon over 2 absolute value of l. How do I pick that? Well, I just started with this expression here, and I moved the l to the other side. All right, they might say, well, what if l were 0? Well, then just make the other side infinity. And then you're fine. Zero is actually great. If you can get zero involved, that's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. So I can definitely pick delta 1 so that that expression is true. So in other words, I can make g of x and m close enough. So if I pick such a delta 1, then I can guarantee that this whole expression is good to go. All right, that was the easy part. What's the hard part? Well, probably the thing we haven't talked about yet. That seems reasonable to say. Now, the thing that makes this hard is that this g of x is not fixed. It's moving around. So how do we fix that? Aha! Remember something. g of x is getting close to m. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that we can pick, again, some delta so that the absolute value of g of x minus m is within 1. Because I can make it within any amount I want. So I can certainly make it within 1. You know, I can make it within 0. 0.001. So 1 is no problem. All right, well, how does that help us? Well, if it's the case that g of x minus m is less than 1, well, that says that g of x has to be less than uh, 
Well, absolute value of m plus one. There's a little bit of, of manipulation there. It's fine detail. We'll, we'll skip skip the manipulation here. So I can say that I can replace this and make something because remember we just have to respect the direction of the inequality. So I can replace this by absolute value of m plus one. Okay. Now it's a fixed value. We do the same thing that we did here. So now it's our third choice for delta, right? So we're going to pick delta 3 so that f of x minus l is less than epsilon over 2 times absolute value of m plus 1. Now why do we do that choice? Well, because now if I can make this f of x minus l small, and I know I can because I have that ability, then I, if I take this epsilon over 2 times absolute value of m plus 1 times something which is bounded by absolute value of m plus 1, then the whole thing combined together is less than epsilon over 2. And now that's smaller than epsilon over 2, and that's smaller than epsilon over 2, as long as I've picked my delta satisfying all of these three, three conditions. So how do I do that? Well, now our real delta is going to be the smallest of them. So, delta 1, delta 2, and delta 3. Alright? Then, putting it all together, that's less than epsilon, and we're done. It's because we've shown that by picking a small enough delta, we can make f of x, g of x minus lm as small as we like. Because I haven't said anything about, you know, what the choice for epsilon is. Remember, you can never force a choice for epsilon. Epsilon has to be arbitrary, and you have to work with it being arbitrarily small. But that's where you go. And now with this, you can start doing lots of more interesting limits without having to work so hard. This is sort of the backbone showing why polynomials have such nice limits. And uh, if you like this kind of stuff, I, I strongly encourage you, take more math classes. You'll do this a lot. And uh, if you don't like this kind of stuff, don't give up on calculus because you can enjoy all there is with calculus without having, <coughs> excuse me, without being great at limits. In fact, uh, sometimes it's to your advantage to really build the intuition before being bogged down in details. All right, good. Well, keep going.